Thank you. Oh, Phil. That's the mum in me. Okay. Um, right. I really do want you to be quiet because uh, the next speaker is just extraordinary. And what's really amazing is that the title of one of the world's greatest, most courageous adventurers of modern time has got to be one of the tiniest little poppets I think I've ever laid eyes on in my life. <laughs> Sweet. Her arms are like toothpicks. I just, you know, it's, it's baffling. But my word, this gorgeous young Queenslander is determined. So determined. Jessica has lived on or near the sea for pretty much all of her life. Sailed dinghies from the age of eight, inspired by the stories of our wonderful Kay Cotty, the first female to sail solo around the world, and of course, Jesse Martin as well, who set the record for the youngest solo sail in 1999. So, led by that, Jessica said, right, I'm gonna do the same. I'm going to become an experienced sailor. Now, before setting off on her solo circumnavigation of the globe, oh, what a sentence, just love saying that. In October 2009, she notched up more than 6,000 nautical miles of ocean sailing experience, proving naysayers and pessimists wrong. Jessica spent 210 days alone at sea, arriving safely back at port, as we heard tonight, this little speck, this little speck coming through our beloved Sydney Harbour heads just three days before turning 17. She's extraordinary, sailing her vessel, Ella's Pink Lady, across more than 20,000 nautical miles of ocean, including around Cape Horn and the Cape of Good Hope, surviving knockdowns, 10 meter high waves, winds of up to 70 knots, did I mention? Toothpick arms, bizarre. She's one of Australia's greatest adventurers, and my word, what a magnificent role model to all of us, to so many right around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Watson. Well, thank you very much for that incredible introduction. And yes, it's true, I was a little nervous about speaking tonight because obviously we have such an incredible room full of people and it's pretty incredible to be asked to speak when there are so, so many amazing stories in this room tonight. But my story started quite differently to what most people would expect uh, from somebody who went on to sail around the world. Because as a little girl, which let's be honest was not that long ago, I was terrified of everything. I didn't like sailing. I was scared of the water. I didn't like going fast. I didn't really like climbing trees, any of those things you'd expect. I wasn't motivated by adrenaline rushes as my siblings were. And we lived on the water. We actually lived on a boat for quite a few years. My older sister was a natural sailor, and of course I wanted to be just like her. I think back then, I didn't realize it, that I was starting to understand adventure, and would set off across lakes with packed lunches and map the coastlines of rivers with my siblings, um, getting ourselves into trouble and then back out of trouble. But I still never, ever imagined I'd go on to do anything like this. But I also had the incredible fortune of being very dyslexic because mum would read to me all the time. And she read all these adventure stories, a lot of books by people who've been and have, and are not tonight in this room, stories of old guys with beards who've done incredible things. She kind of shot herself in the foot a little bit. I'm not sure if she entirely realised what she was doing by reading me these stories and telling me I could do anything I set my mind to. I'm sure she came to regret that. But it wasn't until I was 11 that everything changed for me. And this was because mum read me another book. And this time it was Jesse Martin's book. And the difference with his story is, sure, it was another great adventure and there was adrenaline and all these amazing things. But the difference this time was that I could relate to him. He was the guy who lived next door and he'd gone on to sail around the world. And that just started me thinking, well, if he can do that, what is it that I can do? So I started thinking, thought about it for a couple of years, visualising before I knew what visualisation was. I mean, can you imagine right now being completely, probably a lot of people here can, 
in the middle of the ocean, surrounded by water in every single direction, and how that would feel. Well, I decided that's something I wanted to try. I told, I didn't ask mum and dad what I wanted to do. Probably should have asked. <laughs> Pretty cruel of me, but that does go a long way to show the sort of mind frame. And it was incredibly cruel and selfish when I look back now, what I put them through. And then I set about all sorts of preparation. A lot of sea miles. I had to learn everything from navigating by the stars, celestial navigation. Of course, I got out there and I turned on the GPS, but good thing to know. Uh, to fixing up engines, stitching up sails, rebuilding the boat, uh, navigating, as I said, and first aid. I remember sitting in my first aid course learning CPR and going, great, I'm a solo sailor. This is going to be a fantastic skill. <laughs> All of these things. And of course, the big day where I finally got a boat. Up until this point, I'd been washing dishes through the night sometimes, and I worked out that it was going to take me till I was 40 years old to be able to afford to sail around the world. So supporters and sponsors became a huge part of this voyage and this dream as well. And it became a lot more than just a solo voyage. This was the incredible day here when one of those old adventurers with the beards, Don McIntyre, and his wife Margie at the time, brought me this boat to use. An incredible gesture. I was in New Zealand sailing at the time, and that's my family there in the picture. But little did I know, that was just the start of a lot more hard work. We put her in a shed, we stripped her right back, we strengthened her up, put completely new equipment on board for months on end, and an incredible story and a simple kind of lesson for me in leadership. Because these were all volunteers, and they came from all around the country and even the world to help. We put an ad in a magazine and asked them for help, and I fully expected absolutely nobody to reply. And they didn't, they came, and mum cooked them dinner at the end of the day. And I started really struggling with how I was going to thank these people enough for what they were doing. I mean, they were just doing so much, and I was never going to be able to thank them enough or give them anything in return. But thankfully, halfway through that, somebody sat me down and told me I was looking at it entirely wrong. It wasn't about how I was going to thank them, because it's true, I wasn't going to be able to thank them enough for what they'd done. It was about them being part of this dream as well. And by the time I set off, it was as much their voyage as it was my voyage, and so much more special because of it that I got to share it with these incredible people. So after all this work and all these jobs, my favourite thing that we did, painted boat bright pink. People ask why pink, and I sort of say, why not? It was one of those decisions um, that came up with a, a bunch of guys at sort of Smoko at lunchtime. Uh, the other sort of story there is that it was free because I don't think pink ba boat paint is jumping off the shelves. So they had a <laughs> tin that they were pretty desperate to get rid of. After all of this, nearly ready to leave, is there anyone in the room here today who doesn't know what happened next? I'd love to see a hand in the air right now. Might have been long enough. No, <laughs> not a single hand. <laughs> That's a, a shame. Maybe a few more years, we'll forget. Well, yes, one hand. That's exciting. Uh, for that one person down the back there, the long story short is on a sea trail just before I left. First night out to sea, I ran smack bang into the middle of a 63,000 tonne container ship. <laughs> so I'm sure, as a lot of people will probably remember, it was pretty traumatic. There was a lot of terrible media attention, which I can actually very much understand when you say, hey, I'm ready to sail around the world and set off and run into a ship. I can see where they're coming from and being concerned. There was a lot of damage to the boat, but the strange thing is, I just it happened for a reason. I look back and I would not wish it on my worst enemy. It was incredibly traumatic, but it really did happen for a reason. I mean, obviously I learned a lot. Don't hit ships, that's quite simple. <laughs> we improved the equipment on board that should have told me there was a ship nearby. But I came out tougher because of it. And I realized that I was actually ready for this because I'd kept a cool head right in the middle of that and realized that's actually the last piece of the puzzle for me. I am ready right at the same time when everyone else was saying, you are not ready. <laughs> so finally actually set off from Sydney Harbour here, an incredibly emotional day to finally leave. A very proud day, which might be a strange emotion for that day of leaving. Set off across the Pacific Ocean, beautiful place to go sailing. Did a little bit of fishing along the way through the Pacific. 210 days around the world, 23,000 nautical miles, and that's the only fish I caught. <laughs> It's a very unlucky fish. 
I also climbed up the mast while I was sailing through the Pacific uh, to check everything was okay up there and, and got to the top and I just remember looking down and realising how far I'd come from being a little girl who'd been scared of heights as well to watching the boat sail along below me, a very beautiful thing to see. But inevitably, as I headed south and under Cape Horn, which is the you know, big Everest of sailing in an incredibly amazing and inspiring place right down there by Antarctica, not nearly as cold as some of the stories we've heard, but quite cold enough for me, and into the Atlantic Ocean, the South Atlantic Ocean, about halfway around the world, I hit a really nasty storm. So this was a storm that was forecast. I knew it was going to be a horrible night, but we didn't know quite how bad it was going to get. The conditions built and built, and I just remember sitting out on the deck and watching and, and just being absolutely amazed, mesmerised by these waves, the power of the Southern Ocean, those huge grey moving mountains, and the way they rush through is just something really, really special. But it got dark and the wind and the waves kept building and we experienced a couple of knockdowns. But it was a third of these knockdowns that was particularly bad because wet and dark and the middle of the night as these things always seem to happen at this time of the day, we experienced the worst knockdown. And you can hear these waves coming. You know when you're gonna get one of these knockdowns because there's a huge, huge roaring noise. It's that breaking wave that's bigger than the 10 metre waves I saw. I don't know how much bigger, um, but it was the 10 metre waves that were rolling under us. So I don't want to know how big that wave was. I remember holding on and then having to walk up the walls to stand on the ceiling. And then we're thrown like we're a toy into the trough of the next wave. It's not a gentle rollover in any way. And it's something that has taken me a while to come to terms with talking about, but there were certainly moments and even hours there where I'm thinking, well, I, I just couldn't understand how the boat could possibly survive the force of that wave. And worse still, I'd actually had to pull my life raft down below in the early hours of that storm because it had come loose from the cockpit. The reality is a life raft's a blow-up pull toy and it wasn't really going to do a lot anyway. And having that down below, that was my backup plan gone. Not that it was a great backup plan anyway. So I did have moments there where I'm really genuinely thinking, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And it was really interesting what happened there. It's because I came to the realisation that I didn't really care, other than the fact that I just could not put my family and my team through anything more than this. And I came to this decision that I was going to do absolutely anything I had to, I don't know what I was going to do, to make it through. Thankfully, it didn't come to that. I had some bent up solar panels, some torn sails, a little bit of... I felt a little bit older after that, actually, <laughs> that particular night. But that was about it, a huge testament to the strength of that little boat and the preparation. And of course, there were also some other tough days out at sea where, incredibly frustratingly, I'd be going absolutely nowhere because there was no wind. There were other days when I'd see rubbish floating past in the middle of oceans and how horrible that was to see, plastic in the middle of such a huge ocean. But then there were also really, really beautiful days the albatross in the Southern Ocean were my absolute favourite, the one that glide around the boat for hours on end. And there was one particular night when the water became so perfectly still that it was like a mirror reflecting the stars. And I couldn't actually tell where the sky stopped and where the water began. Really beautiful, but kind of eerie as well. I had to turn on some cheesy music as well that evening. So after all of this, and under Tasmania, under Australia. Turns out that was one of the toughest legs of the trip because I had more storms. Not quite as severe as that one in the Atlantic, but storm after storm. And I had to come to another level and, and kind of dig a little bit deeper. And I just showed myself again how much tougher you can be when you absolutely have to. And one of those knockdowns in one of those storms was particularly annoying because my bottle of dishwashing liquid came flying out of a cupboard. And I came upright and there was dishwashing liquid everywhere. In my bunk, on the roof, on the floor, bubbling up. I'll never ever use lemon fresh dishwashing liquid again. <laughs> the smell of it. <laughs> and finally, I did get back very close to home. And this picture here was taken the day before I came into Sydney. It actually won a, a Walkley Award, which is, of course, absolutely no credit to me because I was sitting down below staying dry. But I absolutely love this picture because it shows what it's like on a rough day. This was what I'd call a rough day, not a particularly severe day. So it probably gives you a little bit of an idea of what it was like on those very rough days out there. Then I got home to Sydney 
and after not seeing a person in the entire time I'd been away, I hadn't seen land for months on end. There's a lot of grey, empty, boring ocean out there. <laughs> there were people absolutely everywhere, and boats and uh, all sorts of things. And for me, you know, the smell of land, the colours, and particularly people's faces were just so vivid to me. I kept staring at everyone like they were aliens. We made it through that harbour and the Prime Minister, who was there at the time, um, stood up and called me a hero, which was incredible as I'd been running late and kept him waiting for about five year, hours. Uh, and I stood up and told him that I disagreed and there was this terrible awkward pause as everyone applauded before I could finish and say uh, that I disagreed, that I wasn't a hero and, and I really wanted to be quite strong about that because it's true, there's a lot of incredible people who do heroic things and, and for me that's not what I did. But from that moment when I did step back on land, everyone asked, what's next? What are you going to do next? How are you going to better that? And the reality was, I'd just sailed around the world, but when it came to sailing fast, I was terrible. <laughs> I still am. So I wanted to learn to sail a lot faster, and I did that by putting together a youth team, and we competed in the Sydney to Hobart with this team, the youngest ever team, all under 21. I was the skipper at 18, and six guys, four girls, mixed up, um, kept the gender uh, divide there equal by painting the boat pink again. And this was a really interesting project that came together over a year and we trained three months full time, had an incredible um, coaching support team who put us through a lot of very corporate um, and very formal sort of leadership and team building, which is very strange for a bunch of teenagers on a boat. Uh, we set off, our coaches decided to race against us. They're there in the green and we're in the pink. It's very much a sprint rather than that marathon around the world. You're, you're not sleeping. When you are sleeping, it's on the side of the boat with your legs over the side, hiking out, um, constantly changing positions that entire time. And I'm very, very proud to finish up, that we finished up second and beat our coaches. And the interesting thing about that was we weren't the best sailors at all. But what we did was we got the best out of each other. We knew each other well and we could really, we knew how to get the best out of each other as a team. And that's why we could do okay in the end there. Other than that, it's been an absolutely incredible five years since I sailed around the world now. And I had to go back and finish school and get my driver's license and I'm finishing up my degree now. Things like that. I also got to travel and actually go around the world and stop at some places. Um, some really, really incredible experiences. Uh, the Young Australian of the Year was an absolutely incredible year and a very humbling experience when I was up against just the most incredible uh, nominees for that award and, and again something I really struggled with and I couldn't understand how I'd been chosen and I had to look at it as an opportunity so I kept myself very busy that year and worked very hard to make myself feel like I'd earned it. Uh, this year I've been able to do a bit of work with the United Nations, well before this year as well, World Food Program and go over to places like Jordan and, and Lebanon and again just be very very inspired by the people there and the young girls there who are just putting on such brave faces in, in really interesting situations. Uh, these days, I still sail, I love it more than ever, and I've come to appreciate and I try and treat everything like an adventure. I think that's really, really important. I look back on what I did and, of course, there was a huge amount of risk to it. Probably a lot more calculated than a lot of people realise, and certainly realised at the time. One of my mentors always talked about something called responsible risk-taking, which sounds a little bit crazy, but that's very much what it was. But the truth is, it was also an adventure, and I think the room here knows very well that there's also a slight unknown element to an adventure. That's why you do it. You don't do it because you know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and I think the big thing is, and probably don't need to tell this room tonight, that there's also a risk in doing nothing. <laughs> so I'm going to finish up there, and I think we did have a little bit of time for some questions, if there were any as well. Um, I'd love to hear them, or I'll be around this evening as well. <laughs> Thanks. Well done. Beautifully spoken. We do have a moment for some questions. If anyone would like to stand up and, and ask, I, I know that I certainly would like to ask something. I know you mentioned a little bit about the youth city to Hobart and, and being a part of a team. What was that like for you to be a part of a team after being in charge of, of everything <laughs> yourself for so long? Yeah, it was a little letting go. The first day of training was very interesting and it was actually a big setup by my coaches as a big failure for me to realise 
um, that I couldn't be the one in charge and I couldn't be doing everything and I couldn't be leading by example because I was not the fastest and the best sailor on the boat. So my role as a skipper was quite unique and it's probably not something you see traditionally on yachts. You normally have the skipper as the biggest, scariest, strongest person with the loudest voice yelling orders, which works pretty well most of the time. So I had to take this completely different approach because I couldn't even yell over the wind. <laughs> so I had to work to get the best out of my crew. So it was quite different and yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. You but it was it. a lot of learning and yeah. Something that I noticed when you were speaking you were saying the, the waves rolled under us and we <laughs> did this. <Yes. laughs> I couldn't help but notice that you, you didn't seem to be alone mentally out in the middle of nowhere. Did you ever feel truly lonely? There's a few conspiracy theories, I believe, about me not actually being by myself. <laughs> I think there's a refusal for people to believe what a 16-year-old's capable of. But, um, <laughs> Jealousy is a curse. <laughs> I'm not sure it's that, but... Um, but it is very true. I, I do say we because it was me and Pink Lady, my boat, yeah. of course. Oh, but, yeah. it, but it was more than that. It was that team I talked about very much and the people all around the world who kind of followed it. It was not something I ever expected, but it, it became really important. And I don't use the word lonely. Lonely is Friday mm. night and you're sitting at home by yourself. And it's a bit, a bit boring. It was completely different because it was my choice to be out there. Mm. And I honestly can't say I was lonely. I can say that I completely had meltdowns and missed everyone like crazy and I just wanted a hug but I wasn't lonely. Are there any other questions in the room? I, I will just ask uh, one more, just, just while I have yeah. you up here. Just with the calibre of people in the room tonight and um, the, the adventures that they have gone on, I'm kind of intrigued. First thing you did when you got home, you've been on that boat <laughs> for so long. When you get home, was there a certain, did you want Vegemite toast? Did you, was it your shower? What was it that you were like, oh, I'm hanging out for? There are a lot of things. Uh, obviously, you know, your family, my brother, which, you know, he annoys me to death, of course, back on land, but he's the one I missed probably more than anything. Really? Yeah. But um, I'm going for a walk. <laughs> when you're stuck on a boat that's like the length of this stage, you know, I wanted to go for a walk. <laughs> which you probably couldn't, being Jessica Watson, having yeah. just come in the heads and the Prime Minister's called you a hero. Yeah. Uh, we ran away that night and I chased sea seagulls on the beach. But, Did you? Um, yeah. You can still yeah, escape. <laughs> Jessica, on behalf of the room, we really are in awe of you, you gorgeous little thing. <laughs> we are so very proud of you. Thank Once you. again, ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Thank Watson. You. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much.